Thank you for that great intro. So, I'm just looking around. Um, it's great to see all of you coming out today to come hear about my journey into STEM and why I chose STEM and how I got there. So, um, I, if somebody wants to like just flag me when I've hit 15 minutes, because I'm supposed to spend 15 minutes on my background, that'd be great. Because otherwise I will talk forever. <laughs> So um, I think growing up, I always enjoyed science, and I always liked people. And so um, for Asian Americans, the joke is you have to either be a PhD, an MD, or now programmer, right? And so um, it was a decision between medicine and doing research. And certainly you can do both. And you don't have to get both degrees, MD, PhD. And if any of you are considering that, I would strongly um, suggest that you talk to me afterwards. Because I see the people that do both. And eventually, you have to choose a lane. You're either going to focus on research, or you're going to see patients. And even if you are an MD, you can always do research. You don't necessarily need the PhD. And if you're the PhD, you can also do um, patient-oriented stuff. But it is harder to get access to patients, because you don't have the MD. So starting, my story goes, starting back in fourth grade, I've always wanted to be a doctor. My mom was a nurse, and she said, don't be a nurse, be a doctor. Because the nurses do all the scut work, changing the bedpans, putting the IV, wiping people, changing poo, dealing with vomit. And the doctors just make the orders, and we get all the credit, right? And even the hard part, like, oh, I order these shots. I walk out of the room. The nurse has to give the shots. Who does the kid associate with the shot? Not me, because I was out of the room. <laughs> so um, that was a tip for my mom, and that's why I became a physician. However, if you want to go into primary care, which is just general pediatrics or general internal medicine, my tip to you is don't be a doctor, be a nurse practitioner. And so a nurse practitioner, if you don't know, can do everything a doctor can do. They just have to have their charts checked like three times a week by a doctor to approve it. And they have a lot less school that they have to go through and therefore a lot less debt and a lot less stress. And in some times, they even make more money. And the specific example is, is at Stanford, when I signed on as a physician, I was like, oh, thank you, thank you for this position. And I never even asked how much they were gonna pay me because I was like, oh, it's Stanford, right? But the nurse practitioner, I found out, made more. And the reason why the nurse practitioners make more is because you're unionized. As doctors, we are not allowed to unionize because there's some law or something like that. But for some reason, the nurses can unionize. And being part of a union is a great thing because they fight for your rights, they make sure you get vacation, and they make sure you get a fair and minimal pay. Whereas for doctors, they can just offer us a number and like, oh, OK, it's Stanford, you know, and we'll take the job. So know that if you are interested in general medicine and not a specific subspecialty, I would actually really recommend being a nurse practitioner and not being a physician. But if you want to specialize um, in the heart, the lungs, any particular body organ, the skin, or you want to be a surgeon or anything like that, then you do want to do the MD. And um, for any of you that are like, I'm going to do the MD-PhD because it pays for the MD, any MD you take, you will make the money back. Don't be, don't be doing the PhD just to cover the MD. Do the PhD because you want to do the PhD. Um, so yeah, back in fourth grade, the story goes, and you always want to look for a good application story. Um, I started collecting stickers, and the stickers were not for me. The stickers were for my future patients. So I could get like three or four sheets of the same stickers so that my future patients you know, wouldn't just get one. And then from there, I've always been passionate about women and women's rights and preventing unplanned pregnancy, because every unplanned pregnancy is something we could have planned, something we could have prevented. If somebody had comprehensive sex ed, if they had access to confidential reproductive health care, you can have sex, but nobody needs to get pregnant unless you want to get pregnant. You can have sex, but don't get a sexually transmitted disease. Make sure you use condoms and just assume everybody you're having sex with has a disease. So protect yourself and protect your future children. And so oftentimes I'll see people won't use a condom for themselves, but they'll use it for their future child. So I want you to be the future health educators out there telling people that the number one sexually transmitted infection, can anyone name that in this room? 
HPV. <laughs> so it's the human papillomavirus. If you all haven't gotten your shot for that, you should run out and get your shot. It's three shots. It's one now, one in a month or two, and then one six months later. However, it only covers nine out of 160 strains. So you have 151 strains you are not covered for. The other thing is oftentimes people will go get tested for sexually transmitted infections, being good, and they're like, oh, well me and my partner got tested and we're all negative. Well, what did you get tested for? You only got tested for probably gonorrhea, chlamydia. If there was no blood or no cheek, you were not tested for HIV and is there a commercially available test for HPV in men? Yes or no? All right, everybody who says uh, no, raise your hands. You all are right. So that is a scary thing. The number one sexually transmitted infection, there is no test in men. And so when a guy says, I got tested, you got tested for what we have a test for. You didn't get tested for what we don't have a test for. So you need to just assume everyone has every disease under the sun. And then for the men, um, the example I give is unfortunately one out of five college women will be sexually assaulted. And on general, if you hook up with somebody, it's gonna take them three years to trust you, to tell you that they were sexually assaulted. And so if you haven't been with somebody for three years, you don't know, she could have been sexually assaulted, she never told you, if you don't use something with her, you just got all the diseases her sexual assaultant gave to her. And then the other thing is just because they look clean doesn't mean that they are clean. So my thing is even as a doctor, I can stick a speculum in a woman and like look around and say, hey, that looks pretty clean to me, but then you have sex with it and then a week or two later, it's like, oh, that was not clean. So we only call it when we see it. And so HIV is in the blood, herpes is in the blood, HPV is in the blood. So. Um, just assume everybody has every disease. And again, if you can't do it for yourself, I don't like the condom, it doesn't feel good, blah, blah, um, do it for your future child. Because if you get a disease, you give it to your significant other, and that baby comes out of that vagina, your baby's gonna get covered with herpes. Your baby's gonna get covered with warts. And if your baby gets warts, I had a patient who came in, 17 year old, has a tracheostomy. Do you guys know what a tracheostomy is? Tell us what a tracheostomy is. So a tracheostomy um, is trachea, and then ostomy is always a hole. So they poke a hole in there so that person can breathe and that person can speak. And the reason the 17-year-old had tracheostomy, usually it's because you have lung cancer or something like that, but 17 didn't smoke enough to, to have lung cancer. When he or she went through her mo mother's birth canal, got covered with warts. And when you get born and you get covered, your body's like, ah, oh, that's my friend. Whereas normally if you got warts now, you'd be like, oh my God, kill, kill, kill the warts. But um, we don't need that yet. We'll bring it back when we do. Um, so because of that, the body didn't attack the warts, didn't get rid of the warts, and so this baby couldn't breathe, this baby couldn't talk. And the only way is to cut a hole, and for the rest of their life, this baby has to like cover the throat when they want to talk or when they want to breathe, and has this hole because the mom and dad exposed this child to HPV. So if you, I mean, it doesn't happen that often, but if I'm gonna make a baby someday, I want it to be the best baby possible. I don't want it to have a hole in its tracheostomy to start its life. Same thing with herpes. They can get herpes of the eye, they can get herpes of the brain, and I don't want a perfect baby. I don't want a baby with half a brain because herpes ate half of it. I don't want a baby with half an eye because herpes ate half of it. So it's really important that um, it's totally preventable as long as you all use things every single time and ideally you know, minimize your number of partners if possible. So um, that was a, a divergence, but um, that is part of uh, adolescent medicine. So um, let me get back to that. So fourth grade, wanted to be doctor, did stickers. Um, high school, did um, volunteering for Planned Parenthood. So for any of you that are pre-med, you definitely want to volunteer for some medical association. For those of you who want to go to UCSF, about 30% of my class volunteered at San Francisco General. So I grew up in the Bay Area. I've been here since, um, yeah, I've been here since first grade. And I only went away down to Irvine for one year of my life. So I've actually sampled all the ERs in the Bay Area and the two craziest ERs and therefore the best if you're pre-med to write stories and to get recommendations from. Um, anybody want to guess what the two craziest ERs are in the Bay Area? Highland and San Francisco General. 
So Highland is crazy, crazy, and San Francisco General is also crazy. Um, San Francisco General has an affiliation with UC San Francisco, so volunteering there gets you a rec from somebody that's at UCSF. But certainly getting a rec from Highland or just volunteering at Highland or, UC, or uh, San Francisco General, you will see crazy stuff go down. And that makes a very good essay for um, whatever pre-health um, area that you're going into. So um, in high school I, or college, I volunteered at a bunch of um, the different, um, I sampled them all. I did, I think, Santa Clara Valley Hospital, and that was kind of like slow and you were like a candy striper and you handed out stuff. I volunteered at Stanford, which again, there was like hold the babies, which is cute and all, but you know, there isn't that much to go on unless you want to go into neonatology. And then at the general, it's you know level five um, trauma, as is Highland, and you would see gunshots, you would see homeless people, you would see barfing, bleeding, uh, you get to run for blood, you get to go in on the codes and help stuff like that. So uh, definitely want to get into volunteering. And then for medical school as well, you want to do some research. So I personally hate research, but I did research throughout high school, I did research throughout college. And part of being pre-med or pre-health is you do whatever the hell you have to to get into med school. And you work your butt off and you suck it up. That's like a big phrase in my life, is suck it up. Uh, you just do whatever anyone tells you and medicine is all about hierarchy. Medicine is about working hard and being tired. And I just remember when I was pre-med, I'm not tired and on the other side, I was like, I'll do whatever it takes to get into medical school. Certainly don't mess with your fellow college classmates, which used to happen at Hopkins. I heard of students sabotaging other students, but I think we do better when we help each other. So definitely band together, uh, commiserate together, share your learnings together. And at UCSF, we actually got together and fought against having grades because at UCSF, we had pass, fail, and then honors. And the difference between honors and not honors was one question on a test. So do you think I'm gonna help you learn anything if that's me and you on one question and I'm pre-med or I used to be pre-med and now I'm med? No, I'm not gonna help you. And so it got really ugly between first year and second year. Because first year we were pass fail and we're all buddies and we're all helping each other. And then came honors and everybody just brought out the crazy pre-med in each other. And so that got really ugly. So um, definitely know when stuff is arbitrary and lame and fight against those kinds of policies. Um, so then college, uh, my tip there, um, when you get recommendations, make sure if it doesn't say you have to waive them, I didn't waive them, and that was actually a lifesaver because I worked for my dad's friend, and um, it, my letter that, the, thank goodness, MIT has a place that gathers all your recommendations, and they reviewed the letters, and they said, you need to look at this letter. And I was like, what's going down? And it's like, uh, Sophia, blah, 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 Sophia, blah, 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 Jennifer would be a great doctor. And so you can imagine, I'm going in this interview, how well do you know Dr. Chen? Oh, I know him really well. How hard did you work for him? I worked my butt off for him. Who's Jennifer? I don't know, who is Jennifer, you know? And so he basically did a search and replace and he didn't do a very good search and replace. And so that would have totally destroyed me. Some small little mess up like that could totally destroy your life. What does it mean to waive a letter? Ah, so when you get these letters of recommendations, they say, I waive the right to see them. And usually people say, if they don't waive them, then it's suspicious. But I actually spoke to all of my letter writers and they said, I'm gonna write the same thing either way. And so on one way, you can waive it because you know it's gonna be a good thing. But on the other hand, I'm really glad I didn't because we were able to catch this error. And this error probably only happens one in a hundred or one in a thousand, but it would really suck if you were that one. So um, that's what it means to waive. And some people will be like, oh, they didn't waive the right, so it's not honest, blah, blah, blah. And then you can counter. I spoke to my recommendation, and they said it's the same. You're welcome to call them. You can check them. You know. And Dr. Yen freaked the hell out of me when she told me this story about this one letter. That, you, know, you could do that. Um, but you, you might want to waive your right. I would discuss it more with your advisors. But for me, it turned out to be a good thing that I did not waive my right to the letter. And then make sure you get good, strong recommendations. Make sure you all know how to prep people for recommendations. 
you want to go to somebody that you have gotten an A or A plus in their class, you want to go, you want to help them by giving them, thank you, um, you want to help them by giving them um, your resume, your essay, and then maybe if you're getting like three different ones, what you want that person to highlight. Because um, sometimes like, I want you to highlight how awesome I am at science. I want you to highlight how much I worked my butt off for the sorority and fundraise for them and stuff like that. And so uh, being a pre-med is all about grades, resume, and test scores. And the test scores are critical. Um, the resume is leadership, research, volunteering, and test scores, I think I already said that, it's test scores and grades. We all, we all know that. All right, so I think that covers my path. Um, one thing I do want you all to take home is that if you mess up anywhere along the way, it's no big deal. You can fix it at the next step. So even if I hadn't gotten into my best med school, which would have sucked, though I didn't actually get into my number one med school, I wanted to go to Harvard, and I ended up at UCSF, but UCSF is far more awesome and far cheaper. My joke was my one year of med school, four years of med school, was cheaper than my brother's one year of private high school. And that was because it was heavily subsidized um, at the time by the UCs, and my brothers went to a crazy expensive private high school. So, um, but also UCSF just has the most brilliant, coolest professors out there. UCSF is basically UC Berkeley's med school. Berkeley does not have a med school, and therefore um, it's UCSF. But my point is, I didn't get into my number one med school, I didn't get into my number one college, I didn't get into my number one med school, and so at any step in the way, you can um, improve up. So if you don't get into your best med school, you can get into the best residency. If you don't get into the best residency, you can get into the best fellowship. Or even if you graduate whatever, the joke is, what do you call the person who was last in their class at med school? Doctor. And, and very few patients know to check their doctors, where'd you go to med school, where'd you go to residency? And if they're crazy old, it doesn't matter because now they have the experience, right? But even then I would say beware because oftentimes when they're old, they aren't keeping up on their literature and whatnot. And so I would want the doctor who knows the latest scientific evidence-based kind of stuff. But just know that no one will necessarily ever ask where you went to med school, where'd you go to residency, what were your grades, what were your MCATs, anything like that. Um, if you go into medicine, you can just be a practitioner. How true is the correlation between the prestige of your medical school and the internship and fellowships that you can possibly attain? Yes. Okay. So he asked a good question. What is the correlation between how good your med school is and the internship and residencies that you obtain? And what I saw was actually uh, a reverse discrimination. So all of us at UCSF kicked everyone else's butt, right, to get into UCSF. But they have this stupid thing called AOA, Alpha Omega Alpha Society, which is the top 10% of every medical school. And all of us who kicked the person who went to Kansas, the person who went to Loma Linda, the person who went to UCLA, the person who went anywhere else except for Harvard, um, we, if we didn't make that top 10%, they were happier to get somebody from Loma Linda who was the top of their class, who I know I could have kicked their butt if I'd gone to Loma Linda, but they picked that person over you. And so the medical school is awesome and that it gives you a great foundation and you're hanging out with the smartest, the best, and the brightest, and you're getting education from the great teachers. But if you're not the top 10%, there's actually discrimination against you when you apply for residency and internship. And we really tried to make that argument to them. Like, I kicked this person, I had a higher MCAT, I've done better, I've been learning under you, he's been learning under Loma Linda, why would you take Loma Linda over me? But he's AOA. So there's these weird, wacky biases in this world. But it does help that if you're from UCSF and you're interviewing at Orange, um, Children's Orange County, I was interviewing there, and I knew I was interviewing out of my league because everybody else in the room was from a med school I've never heard of. And the residency director was directing his entire pitch to me because I was UCSF and they were schools I'd never heard of. So it, it depends, you know, but amongst the top of the top, there's this whack bias. Um, but on the other level, you will you know, continue to crush. But again, you can change it at any time. You can go to Kansas for residency, but then come back to UCSF for fellowship. You can do fellowship in Kansas, but then you come back to Stanford for your professorship. 
It's anywhere along the way you can correct it. It is not a dead end. It is no big deal. Um, just work hard and you know, aim for the, the highest possible opportunity there. So um, I was told to tell you guys a little bit about my research, but I thought I'd tell you a little bit about um, startup life. And in that, we could um, hit some research as well. So we'll see if the slides will come up. I think it's talking. Ah, there we go. So as you had mentioned, um, my life trajectory started off being a physician, helping patients one-on-one, -on -one, then going to become a professor and teaching the future medical future doctors, the medical students, the residents, the fellows, and then getting on national committees and um, giving national lectures on emergency contraception and birth control and how you should properly take care of teenagers. But then when I was preparing a talk on birth control, one of the top three reasons women don't take their birth control is they don't have it on hand. And I said, well, that's easy. We can solve that. We'll just ship it to you and keep shipping it to you until you tell us to stop. And then when we ran ads for free birth control delivery, 60% of the women that responded to those ads didn't have a prescription. I'm a doctor. I can write prescriptions. And so we added on a telemedicine component to it. And what's different about our telemedicine is you guys may or may not have heard about what's going on in telemedicine. Usually it's a video, it's a phone call. Ours is asynchronous telemedicine. You just fill out a questionnaire, give us your blood pressure, give us a selfie to prove you are who you are, um, tell us what your health insurance is, pay us $39 for our doctor's time and overhead, and then we look at it, looks good, we write the prescription, we bill it to insurance, and we ship it to you. So that way you're set for the entire year. No one runs out of birth control on our watch because as I mentioned, every unplanned pregnancy is unfortunate <laughs> and unnecessary. And then I'm gonna go on a segue because there are a lot of women in this room. Um, part of it is educating women that birth control is not just for birth control. So as a pre-health student, do you think you're gonna do better on your finals on your period or off your period? Yell it out. Off, right? And so for every woman that's menstruating, you are choosing to menstruate. So as health providers, we're always educating people, you need to have a period every single month. However, that's if you're not on any medications, because if you're not having a period every month, I need to check your thyroid, I need to check for a tumor, I need to make sure you don't have anorexia, or you have any kind of whack stuff going on. But we can put you on the birth control pill or the birth control ring, and you can have no periods. And so it came to me, Literally, I was taking a biochemistry final, and I'm in the middle of a biochemistry final, I'm like, da -da 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 -da, and then blood. And I was like, ah, do I like run to the bathroom and then risk blood everywhere, or do I finish the final? And being a pre-med, what did I do? Finish the final. But was I a little distracted? Hell yeah. Was the guy next to me like, no, nah, da, 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 right? And so even if you're, my joke is, if you're an anal pre-med who's not getting any sex, it might behoove you to go on the birth control pill or ring to turn off your periods because it will make you academically competitive, right? If the girl next to you is like, ah, blood, and you're like, do, 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 you know, you're gonna kick butt. And actually, they've actually shown that the number one cause of anemia in a menstruating woman is, what do you all think? Menstruation. And the number one cause of missed work in school in a woman under the age of 25 is menstruation. And they've actually shown that before you have anemia, because we as doctors always check the hemoglobin for anemia, you have iron deficiency. And they took a whole bunch of iron deficient kids and they checked their IQ. Then they gave them iron and they checked their IQ again. What do you think happened when they got their iron back? Their IQ went up. And so you may be functioning at a couple IQ points short because you're losing blood every single month and no one has checked you for iron deficiency anemia. So that's my radical feminist proposal. And if you have questions, we can, we can discuss it some more afterwards. All right. So the idea of Pandia Health, um, Pan is every, Dia is day. So we have you covered every single day for your birth control needs. Um, Pandia is also the Greek goddess of healing, light, and full moon. So we're starting with birth control, but our goal is to grow with women as they grow. And so when they stop their birth control, do you need some prenatal lights? Do you want to be hooked up with this fertility company? As they get older, do you want some menopause? Do you want some wrinkle cream? But we're starting with birth control. And if you guys don't know already, this country has a problem with sex. 
in that all the stuff is like sex, 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 right? But when there was a TV show called, um, I think it was called Temptation Island, and they had like 20 couples and they're trying to break them up with sex, right? And they said, can we run a birth control um, commercial during the TV show? And they said, oh no, that's not within our values. And it's like, you're pushing sex to break up these people, but you won't let us prevent unplanned pregnancy or you won't let us run a condom um, ad, right? And so um, the point about Pandia Health is that very few companies will talk about sex. Very few companies will talk about birth control, even though 80% of women will use the birth control pill, patch, or ring some point in their life. And so we're taking a negative and turning it into a positive. You won't talk about it, I'm gonna talk about it, and I'm gonna market it straight to women and make their lives easier. And so the big term picture for Pandia Health is to provide confidential, convenient and reliable healthcare. So confidential because you can do it wherever you have a phone. So you could like sign up right now here, or you could sign up in the bathroom, or you could sign up in the library, you know, wherever you have the internet. And then convenient is that you don't have to run to the pharmacy every single month. And reliable, set it and forget it, let us worry so you don't worry. Because you have better things to do. Know that 45% of the pregnancies in the United States are unintended. We should get that number down to zero or five. 64% um, in 20 to 24 year olds. So that's a huge opportunity to prevent unplanned pregnancy. Different from planned pregnancy, but oops, wasn't planning this right now, not in my career trajectory. And I would strongly recommend not getting pregnant until fellowship, and even then it depends what fellowship you do. If you do like a cardiac thoracic fellowship, definitely not. If you do Alice in Medicine, you could probably handle it. But you would want to be there for your child and know that medicine is crazy rigorous. So I strongly, strongly recommend do not have a child until after. If you already have a child, that's fine. But don't start it in med school and don't do it during residency or fellowship. Um, and that is that slide. The current number of users of birth control, just for fun, 10.7 million women currently use the birth control pill patch ring, and another 7 million would use it if, quote, easily available. We bring birth control to wherever you have internet and a mailbox. And so that is really my goal with this company, is to bust open access to everybody anywhere. So if you live two hours away from the nearest doctor, or two hours away from the nearest pharmacy, or you live in a very conservative town, that if you showed up to the pharmacy, they're like, Sophia, you again for birth control. And then everybody in the whole town knows, if you went to the pharmacy for the birth control, you know? and so by this, we bring it by mail. And we allow you this confidentiality, and we allow you to prevent unplanned pregnancy. And it's a $4.6 billion company. Um, Yes. Oh, yes. If you want to put in referral code HAPPY, that would be great. So um, somebody's checking us out. Monthly madness. So the monthly madness is if for the men in the room who've never encountered, but good for you to know because you're going to be doctors or in the health field. Um, I've coined this terminology pill anxiety. It's never been brought up in medicine before. So imagine as you get to that last week. If you don't get to the pharmacy, there will be a dire consequence. You risk pregnancy, right? And women go through this every single month for 20 to 30 years of their lives. And they're like, how come no one ever thought of this? And I was like, it took a woman doctor to go through this pill anxiety every single month for 20 to 30 years of my life to be like, why am I worrying about this? Why am I wasting time running to the pharmacy? So we calculated women spend 10 weeks of their lives go to the pharmacy, when you're with a drug, coming back home. You have better things today. In today's day and age, it should come to your door, and that's what we're gonna make happen. Um, and then we spend about 20 to 30 years avoiding pregnancy. Any of you been to the pharmacy, you know it looks like this. I've never gone in the pharmacy, got my drug, and walked out. There's always that line, right? And our target audience is certainly any woman of reproductive age. We're serving people from 13 to 55. And the 13-year-old is using it because she has bad, evil cramps and is missing school, and her mom knows and is giving her permission. Um, and the 55-year-old just doesn't want her periods and doesn't want to deal with it. But you all are in this demographic. You're busy. You move around. You're used to ordering stuff online. You're used to stuff coming by mailbox. And you're new to healthcare. You don't have any loyalty to any pharmacy. Just whoever will get you your stuff. 
and current pharmacies don't work for you necessarily. My example is I have one patient um, at Stanford, and her mom lives in Texas. The mom needs her drugs in Texas for her high blood pressure, but the girl needs her drugs at Stanford for birth control. Um, the horrible thing is these old giant you know, pharmacies, they're slow, and it takes them forever to change their computer system. And the example I give, if you all have an experience, the electronic health record, um, when I pointed out to our electronic health record, there's this problem and it's wasting all these doctors' time. All I need you to do is change this. They're like, that'll take four years. And I was like, four years? My husband works at Apple. They changed their operating system in six months. What are you talking about? Four years. So they just have an old system they can't change. We have a startup. We can change our system every single day. But we change it once a week. But if there's an emergency, we will change it once a day. And so we are able to accommodate two different addresses. We go to the end user, the woman, and we say, where do you live? What do you need? We ship it to you. Rather than keep sending it to Texas, and the Texas has to send it over here. Or you can imagine if you guys head off to New York or Boston, that your mom's sending from California to Boston. That's ridiculous. It should just go to whoever needs it, wherever they need it. Question? Um, the end-to-end -end solution. So there are other companies out there that will do just the delivery, but they are not going to solve the 60% who don't have a prescription. There are other people that do the telemedicine, but they're not going to do the delivery. And as I call it, the hair on fire moment is, holy crap, I need my medications, right? So you really need to do the delivery if you want to help the patient. And so we do all of it, or we can do part of it. If you love going to your pharmacy, we'll write you the prescription and you can go to your pharmacy. But I hope that you will not want to run to your pharmacy. So right now we're just doing birth control. Right now we're doing the birth control pill patch. But definitely our pharmacy is a full service pharmacy. And in the future we can consider other drugs. People have mentioned thyroid medication, asthma medication, kind of chronic medications. In the future we also envision adding acne, which would be very easy. And so um, definitely we want to become the brand that women trust with their health and we want to grow with them and service them however they need. But in general, for most women, their one drug for many years is just the birth control pill or patch or ring. And for those of you considering, I really um, would suggest the ring and then the patch the pill. The ring, because you only have to think about it once a month. The pill, you have 365 chances to mess up. The patch, you have uh, 52 chances to mess up. And so the, all the physicians used to be on the ring, now all the physicians are on the IUD with hormones. So that's something to consider as well. Not good for my company, but it's what I would recommend to you if you were my patient or my daughter, is the IUD with hormone. Don't let anybody talk you into the IUD without hormone because it's more blood, more pain. So a woman in a red mind wants more blood, more pain. But some women are anti-hormone and want to be natural, so they go with the more blood, more pain. So. Your call. Um, I thought I'd show you the team. We are different. Um, I'm in the startup world, and it's fun, and it's exciting, but it's also horrific. Um, I'm, as a physician, as a health person, we're very conservative, right? We don't like to take risks. And I'm not a roller coaster person, but with the startup, I've had my highest highs and my lowest lows, all within one email. So I get one email, and I'd be like, yes, they want to fund me. Uh, they don't want to fund me, you know, and it's like every time you see it, like, this is going to be high or this is going to be low, I don't want to open this email. <laughs> um, but what's unique and different about me and my company is the diversity. What's unique and different about my company is we're the only women-founded, women-led company in this space. We're the only company led by a reproductive health doctor. You think if you want to do birth control, not so much internal medicine, right? Should be ob or adolescent medicine. I actually chose adolescent medicine because OB, you got to deliver the babies and they got to wake you up at 3 a.m. and like, when the water breaks and all that stuff, I was like, no. And then I didn't want to do the gynecology because it was surgery and I didn't want to deal with, um, I'm not so great at anatomy and all that stuff and the hierarchy and the hours, but I found adolescent medicine where I could do outpatient gynecology and pap smears and STIs and preventing unplanned pregnancy. So I really love adolescent medicine. Um, 
And then the other difference is that we are a pharmacy company, and we are one of the few pharmacy companies founded by pharmacists. So you would think if you're going to open a pharmacy company, you should have a pharmacist founder. But a lot of people will hire a doctor and hire a pharmacist. And um, it's just not the same. Because I'm a founder, I'm thinking about this 24-7, every living, breathing moment. And I'm like, idea, 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 idea. Whereas if you hire somebody, you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know what to ask your consultant. And even then, there's a delay. So when something comes up, we have a doctor on it right away. Whereas normally, you have to find the doctor. If I'm the doctor, when they have time, the doctor comes back, they give you the answer, and you're a day or two or a week behind. So I really think that if you are going to consider doing a startup, that you definitely should have the expertise in the founder level. But we'll see how um, this company plays. But I'm really proud that we have a lot of diversity, both in women and ethnicity and age. Uh, there's definitely ageism in the startup world. I'm 45, and uh, what you see is they would much prefer to throw money at the 23-year-old. And I was like, I'm not dead. I got 40 more years in me, right? And I have 20 years of experience behind me. Look at my LinkedIn compared to the 23-year-old's LinkedIn. My friend is VP of product at Google. My friend is VP of Planet Box and Planet RX. His friend just graduated school. How helpful is his friend going to be? But there is that bias. There is the bias for what they see. They want a Zuckerberg, a Caucasian male in a hoodie and jeans, and everybody else doesn't fit that mold because they don't know that, they don't understand it. I'm doing a woman's product. So I walk into a room of VC, 70-year-old Caucasian male, and I talk about what a pain it is to run to the pharmacy every month for my pills. And they're like, well, can't your secretary just deal with that? You know, my wife doesn't complain about that. Your wife is no longer fertile. But also, <laughs> um, your wife had a secretary, your wife had, you know, an assistant or stuff like that. Your wife is not the typical person. Um, what other biases? Oh, as a doctor, there's a bias. They're like, as a doctor, what could you possibly know about running a business? What does this 23-year-old know about running a business? I'm 45, and I've been treasurer for every known organization from high school through college to my homeowners association. I run budgets. I know how to make profit. I have mortgage. I paid a mortgage. Has the 23-year-old paid the mortgage? I've juggled my two kids' schedules. Have they juggled two kids' schedules? Have they had to deal with a significant other and the relationships? That's a big thing I didn't expect in startups. As a physician, you are a god. You are not a god, but you dictate as people do what the hell you tell them. And you run on your own, and nobody questions you pretty much. Um, as a startup, you actually can't be, even though I'm CEO, I have to play well. I have to get along with people and stuff like that. And having a significant other, I've done that. The 23-year-old does not have a significant other, cannot even hold a significant other, but yet they want to invest in him. So um, hopefully the world will diversify in, in terms of funders. Hopefully the world will diversify in, in terms of CEOs. And then uh, the competition. You guys are seeing what's called the pitch deck. So if any of you want to go into startup world, this is fun ish. <laughs> but the pitch deck is you have to explain why you're better than everybody else out there. And that's part of medicine too, right? When you write your essay, you need to explain why you are better than anyone else that they're going to pick or that you are going to, to do stuff for them. And so just this is a tip on your essay. This is a tip on your interview. When you go for your interview, you want them to sell to you. So what I did is I played Harvard versus UCSF. I went to the UCSF interview and I said, I'm at MIT, Harvard's just down the street. I'm used to Harvard, it's Harvard. Why should I choose you? And then that puts them on the defensive. And like, oh, UCSF, very good, very good. I don't wanna lose Sophia to Harvard. Oh my God, we need to rank her high in the list of candidates that we're going to do. And then you need, as always in medicine, to brown nose. UCSF is so amazing. Your program, da 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 da, da and my experience, speak, I speak fluent Spanish. I absolutely could serve your population. Uh, differentiate yourself from the person next to you. That person doesn't speak Spanish. How's he going to serve 60% of the population of California? Not. I speak a little Mandarin, I speak a little Taiwanese, a little Japanese, but really it was a Spanish. And so, but also don't lie. Because um, they will call you on it. One of my interviewers it was Latina, and we just had a great conversation in Spanish because I had taken 10 years of Spanish. 
and was fluent in Spanish. And I had volunteered at Mass General. I just want to tell you the story. It's funny. I walk into Mass General, and they're like, we asked for the Spanish interpreter and not the Chinese. And I said, yo hablo espanol. And they're like, oh, OK. And they're like, can you translate Chinese? I'm like, no, sorry. I can't translate Chinese. <laughs> I didn't take 10 years of Chinese. Do you have a question? OK, cool. So um, sorry, back to the slides. Um, the competition is not end to end. The competition requires a doctor's visit. So if you just saw a doctor, we can just do the prescription, move it from wherever it is to our system and take care of you. And they force everybody to have a doctor's visit and they don't see the big picture. So our big picture on the financial side is the new hot thing in startup world for you all is Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club is a billion dollar company. So in startup world, we all want to be a billion dollar company. It's called Unicorn. And my whole life is unicorns. I buy all sorts of unicorn stuff now anyway. But um, we want to be the Dollar Shave Club, but for women and recession proof. So as times become tough, you're going to toss your razors. You're going to toss your stitch fix. You're going to toss your makeup or whatever. But you're going to hold on to your birth control more than ever. And the, the birth control is also paid for by insurance. So that, that is our big picture, is to become the marketing vehicle for women ages 18 to 35. And um, why Pandia? As I mentioned before, we have domain expertise and trust. So when I talk to doctors, they're going to believe Dr. Yen from Stanford. They're going to believe Dr. Yen, who went to UCSF, and who was their classmate, or who knows their classmate, stuff like that, as opposed to a 23-year-old who just comes knocking on the door and has no clue. Um, relationships to the target audience. We have 500 campus organizations um, that are going to help us be a campus rep. If any of you want to be a campus rep, we would love a couple of you to sign up to help get the word out amongst your fellow classmates. We also would love a connection with student health. Our pitch to student health is, do you want to see any of your students get pregnant in the next two to four years? I don't think so. So why don't you tell them about my service, which is free. We take all insurance for the medications except for Kaiser. The only cost is $39 if you need that doctor's appointment. But $39 is, I think, totally worth it rather than missing work, going, driving, and, and getting back. And if the school was smart, they would cover the 39 bucks because they don't want anybody to get pregnant. But they don't have to cover it. It's all good. Um, and then physician networks and as women. So I have two other competitors out there and they're men run, um, men founded. There was the Women's March. Wouldn't it be smart if you were a birth control company to be at the Women's March? Were they at the Women's March? No. Was I at the Women's March? Hell yeah. I was at San Jose, I was in San Francisco, I was invited to speak on the stage at San Jose. I actually couldn't get to the stage to go speak, so it was a good thing I wasn't one of the speakers because I couldn't get to the stage, it was so far. And there was all these marchers, which was awesome. And then we even did a, a PR play in LA. My co-founder, brilliant, she does this to me. The march is on Saturday. She, Thursday at midnight, says, how about we rent a plane and fly a banner above the people marching in LA? And I was like, that would be awesome. But what are the odds? It's Thursday night, and I have to get this up by Saturday. But I knew that if I didn't, Perla would get angry at me. So during my lunch break on Friday, I call up two companies, and I say, can we do this? And they're like, yeah. So FYI, it's like Scrabble. You pick out the letters, and you pay for it, like Twitter. You only get so many letters, and you pay for them. And so we ran an ad above 350,000 people marching in LA that said, Pandia Health Trust Women, ERA now. And it didn't get the play that it could have if we had better PR or if I had a friend on stage who said, hey, look at that sign. But it was cool. So know that you get to do fun and cool things in the startup world and that stuff can be done. That's the thing, is anything can be done. And don't be afraid to ask. Because the worst is no. But if you didn't ask, you didn't get. And that's my mom's phrase. Don't be afraid to ask. If you don't ask, you don't get. And same thing when you apply to medical school. Don't think it's too far of a reach. Because if we all think it's too far of a reach, and then you reach, you get it. Everybody who didn't think they could do it, they're not going to get it. But it doesn't hurt to try. The ver worst is they say no. The worst is you wasted however much the application fee is. But if you didn't try and you, you took yourself out, especially women. Women, um, when they show like a job application form, Women see it as this is what you want, right? You listed these 10 categories and I have to meet at least eight or nine out of 10. Men see it as suggested. I meet six out of 10. I can learn the other four. And you as a woman could learn the other four too, okay? And so um, just apply for everything. Don't be afraid. Don't think that you don't have enough. If you think you can learn the skills, you can. 
And, and it's really about confidence in yourself. Uh, what else do we have? We have a marketing plan, we have our profit, which you guys don't need to know about, how many patients we have, our big plan, oh, research. You guys will like this. So um, in terms of research, I like doing survey research. If you, if you just need to get papers out and look good real fast, which is kind of pre med um, I love surveys because you don't have to double enter the data and there is no error because the patient entered the data. But this was specifically for this startup. We surveyed um, 123 women currently on the birth control pill patch or ring. And we said, where do you get your birth control? 66% are still going to the pharmacy every single month to go get their medications. 11% um, are Kaiser. We can't serve Kaiser because Kaiser's a monopoly and they won't let us bill them. If they would let us bill them, we would serve them. And then 11% are doing mail order. So mail order is definitely an option, but it's difficult, painful. You have to get your doctor to write the prescription in the correct format, et cetera. Um, barriers to birth control, 31% couldn't get multiple packs at one time. If we're delivering it to you reliably every single month, you don't have to worry about that. Or if we fight for you, advocate for you, yell at the insurance company and say, give this woman her three months or her years worth at a time, because if she gets pregnant, it's gonna cost you far more than a pack of birth control pills. Um, then you will get your medicine. Um, need to see a doctor for the exam. We took care of that by adding the telemedicine situation. Their refill ran out. Again, our job is to worry, so you never have to worry. So a week before we know your pill's gonna run out, we text you and go, are you still at the same address? Do you still want your medicine? If you don't say anything, we're gonna send it to you. And so we just wanna make sure everybody gets their meds, but they haven't changed addresses because people move around a lot, and especially college students. Over the summer, you may be somewhere else, right? Or et cetera. Um, and the pharmacy has inconvenient hours. We're 24-7 online, and we will take care of you. And the refill ran out, you won't run out. Um, what's interesting, if you ever create a product, what percentage of people you interview want to use it? I think this is one of the highest numbers ever. 94% were in the yes, maybe, or definitely. And 34% said, hell yeah, sign me up now which is awesome for a product that you're trying to sell. 42% said yes, and 18% said maybe. So only 6% said, no, I, I don't want this, I don't need this, I love going to the pharmacy every single month. The pharmacy is my best friend. So um, the other survey research I've done that you all could do easily is you have your classmates you can survey. So I did the Stanford sex survey. And we surveyed how many of you all are sexually active? Are you having oral, vaginal, anal sex? If um, you wanted to get birth control or sexually transmitted infection tests, where would you go? And so my kind of research has always been advocacy research. I have a gist of I know what people don't know, and then I quantify it, showing they don't know, and then I either humiliate that group into learning, or I use that as an opportunity to educate. And so one thing, since I have you all captive again, emergency contraception. Do you know how many types of emergency contraception there are? Anybody want to yell out a number? Three. Three. No other number? Types meaning there are very different, um, there's two pills, there's a device, and yeah, and then there's three, three ways to take pills. Yeah, so there are four emergency, sorry, four emergency contraception, and if we were to survey, and actually I gave a lecture to the Stanford Internal Medicine residents, and out of a room of 60, only one person knew the answer, and these are doctors, and these are not first year doctors, these are residents who have gone through medical school, and these are residents from year one to three. So you would hope someone in the room at Stanford Internal Medicine, nope, one. So there are four forms of emergency contraception. Who wants to guess what's the most effective form of emergency contraception? IUD. So a lot of people don't know if you get raped, if the condom popped or whatever, you can use a copper IUD. You can't use the hormonal IUD, which I, is the one I usually recommend because copper IUD has side effects, but if I were raped or if my daughter were raped, I would seriously consider the copper IUD because it's 99.99999% effective in preventing an unplanned pregnancy. What do you guys think is the second form? And again, the Stanford one out of 60 people got this. And I, what? Yes, very good, olopristal acetate. So olopristal acetate, also known as Ella, and most of you don't know that, right? And it's available by prescription only. Under the Affordable Care Act, anything that's prescribed is free, no copay, no deductible. 
So that is the second most effective. So if I were raped or my daughter were raped, I don't know if I'd want an IUD stuck up there, you know, but I also don't know if I want to deal with termination or continuation of a pregnancy by a rapist either. So, so that's what you're weighing. But this medication is, um, I love the acronym, it's SPERM, a selective progesterone receptor modulator. And so um, the next method is plan B, also known as um, levonorgestrel and progesterone. Um, this one is an anti-progesterone. And so progesterone is the, the hormone of pregnancy. Um, and an anti-progesterone will block implantation or block the egg from being released. And so the third one is plan B, but if you all walk into a pharmacy, ask for generic plan B. Because if you ask for plan B, they're like, 60 bucks. If you ask for generic plan B, 20 bucks. So um, I also suggest that you all get it ahead of time. So my mantra is wherever there's a heterosexual male having sex that doesn't want to impregnate, there should be a pack of emergency contraception in case the condom pops. Wherever there's a female, regardless of your orientation, unless you're sterilized, have an IUD, an implant, or regularly go get your depo, there should be some emergency contraception because God forbid you're sexually assaulted. So if the condom pops at 3 a.m., I want the medicine in the woman's mouth by 3.10. I don't want it cuddling, snuggling, huddling, waiting until the morning after. Because if at any time you're falling asleep and the egg pops out, too late, game over. Method is not gonna work. Then you're gonna be talking about termination or continuing a pregnancy that you don't want, okay? And um, all of these methods work out to five days after um, contraceptive failure, condom popping, sexual assault. But I want you all to have a pack ready, sitting in the corner, like a fire extinguisher. And if something horrific <coughs> happens, then you go grab that and you get it right away. As opposed to, oh my God, it's 3 a.m. What pharmacy is open? Who has it? Who has it in stock? You know, you walk in that pharmacy at 3 a.m. They're like, sorry, all we have is the name brand at 60 bucks. But you're like, I don't need it for now. I need it in case of emergency. You order it. I can wait for it, 20 bucks. So um, that's, so I used that information, surveyed physicians, showed them what they didn't know, and doctors really want to do good, right? We want to know the cutting edge, and we want to provide the best medicine. And so by showing physicians they didn't know this information, it was kind of like a push-pull, if you guys ever go into politics, you say, um, did you know blah, blah, blah? And they're like, no, oh, I didn't. And then you've taught it to them, right? Did you know it was a top four? Oh, wasn't it this? No, it's not. This is the correct answer. And thereby, you're educating people, but you're also publishing papers because you're showing doctors don't know this. We also did it with Stanford students. Stanford students don't know this. Stanford students don't know where to go for healthcare. All right, so sorry I talked a lot. Um, I want to open it up for Q&A or just cut it. We'll cut it, and anybody who wants to talk can come up. Or you want Q&A? Q&A, right? Anybody have any questions? Maybe I inundated you with too much information. What are kind of like, I know this really is more but um, what are kind of like the side effects of getting these kinds of concepts? Yes. Like so, yeah. And not having that period instead of just having the period yeah, yeah. sucking through it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, he asked a great question What are the benefits and side effects of using the various methods of birth control? So, um, the IUD with hormone, the main side effects, 70% of the women on that method lose their periods. And a lot of women are like, yeah, no more periods. And then the other 30% continue with their period. But that method is actually better than tubal ligation, which is a woman having snip snip, which is crazy. And the main reason for that is because the progesterone causes a cervical mucus plug so that the sperm can't get up there. So that's really cool. Um, mainly the irritating one is irregular periods for some of the women, but we can treat that with medication. And then um, some people experience like a dull ache for a month or two months afterwards, but it may be worth it to have a little dull ache for seven years worth of birth control. So that's the IUD with hormone. The implants uh, last for three years. It goes through your whole body. And some women have noticed some acne, definitely some irregular periods, and that could be treated. The shot um, has consequences for bone density, but mainly the biggest ones are munchies and irregular bleeding. And so if you're an anorexic, you obviously have a control thing, and so you're over control, so we're not worried about you getting the munchies. But if you're on the heavier side, you're heavier, you're having a harder time controlling what you eat, and so we give you the shot, it's gonna drive you more munchies. Um, and the bone density issue is that um, when you're on Depo-Provera, it stops your bone 
um, density from increasing from age 15 to 35, you're building your bone bank. But the good news is after you come off of it, you go right back to your previous bone density. So it's okay, but just make sure you come off of it at some time. And then the ring, the pill, the patch are all pretty much the same. It's just a question of how often you want to take your medicine and how you want to take it. The ring is intravaginally, the patch is on your body, the pill is in your mouth, the ring is once a month, the patch is every week, and the pill is every single day. Uh, side effects on it, most of them will go away in two to three months. So if you're going to try one of those methods, stick to it for two to three months. Um, the dangers, benefits of skipping your period. So that's the revolutionary thing. There's an article by Malcolm Gladwell called John Rock's Error. If you all want to Google it and read it, it will tell you the benefits and the cons of skipping your period. But what it is, is this incessant menstruation, having a period every single month, is actually unnatural. And I realized this, trying to get pregnant, that the only reason we're building that lining is to wait for an embryo. And if we're not trying to grab an embryo from age 12 to 26 on average in the United States, or 35 for those of us who go into medicine, why are we building and sloughing and building and sloughing, risking endometrial cancer, risking ovarian cancer, and risking anemia in school and you know, all sorts of other bad crap every single month? So that is the revolutionary kind of revelation. Um, so Google the Malcolm Gladwell, he wrote Tipping Point Blink, some great books to read, but specifically John Rock's era. John Rock was one of the three founders of the birth control pill, and there were two other founders, and they said, why are you making everybody have a period every month? It could be every three months, every, once a year. And he's like, I'm a devout Catholic, and we're going to get this through the Catholic Church. I always forget in the Catholic Church that the rhythm method is perfectly fine. So he was just trying to make the period regular so that way you could practice the rhythm method. And he almost got it. The, the nuns, the priests were all cool with it, but the Pope got wind of it and he vetoed it. But because Dr. Rock won that argument with his two founders, every method since has had one week of bleeding every single month. So it's a pretty cool article. What about trauma cases? Like, for instance, you have a patient that's suffered trauma. Is there any? We should cut it. Sorry. Give her a round of applause. She made it well. Thank you, Dr. Really appreciate you coming here. And so we encourage you guys to come back, not next week, but the following week. And Dr. Yin will be here for your questions. So thank you for attending.